Welcome back to Crit and Crit. I am Axiom. I'm Sid. And we are continuing our playthrough of Undertale and our discussion of Redwall by Brian Jenks. And Tutorial is still absolutely handing it to you. Yeah. But I think I've kind of gotten the hang of this a little better. Anyway, our topic today is actually very like the aesthetic of Undertale. Black and white. Specifically, the black and white morality presented by the series. Because Jake's does, throughout the entire series, very clearly determine some species are good and some species are bad. There are very, very few exceptions across the entire series. And we don't really see much of them in this one. Rimwall is very strictly divided. If you are a mouse, a shrew, a vole, a mole, a squirrel, a rabbit, or a badger, you are a good guy. If you are a rat, a weasel, a stoat, a fox, or a reptile, you are a bad guy. You are either a villain or a monster. And not in the Undertale term of monster. <laughs> More like uh, a dragon to be slain by a virtuous knight. As we mentioned in prior uh, episodes, especially in the first episode, uh, that's the role that large uh, reptiles such as snakes, such as in this book, the Adder Asmodeus, take in the, in the series as a whole, and this story is, of course, no exception. This is intentional on Jake's part. And yeah, to be fair, um, while we brought this up before in other series, like Harry Potter, for instance, the intended audience of Redwall is not so much intended to grow up with the books. So, yeah, Harry Potter, we complained about the designated heroes and designated villains' houses, and also the extras. But Harry Potter was, you know, intended for the readers to age along with the series, so things were meant to get more nuanced as they went on, and kind of didn't. Uh, Rebel, on the other hand, is and will, has always remained chapter books for children. There's not a whole lot of room for shades of gray in there, because they're just swashbuckling adventures of little mice on D&D &D adventures who are out to kill the bad guys. And So yeah, well, we will be looking at this and kind of the look at the implications of it, because that's kind of what we do on this channel. Remembering your audience is very important. Thanks, Flowey. That was Hi, very Flowey. Uh, uncomfortably timed. So, Jake's... To quote directly from Jake's, I've got a, a quote from here written down. I will not have sympathetic baddies or schizophrenic goodies in my books. That is not a good lesson for children. He also says... Okay. Uh, he also says, Good always wins, not just in the books, but in real life. If good didn't always win, we would be all walking around with, marching around with swastikas tattooed on our foreheads, wouldn't we? Which is, unfortunately, a very privileged and simplistic way of looking at reality because obviously things are much more complex and much more involved than that and uh, what one might define as good does not always win in reality but I can understand how an author who is primarily targeting single digit age children 
would choose to not focus on such topics when telling their stories and keep things to a more uh, fairy tale, good and evil simplicity. Hi, Sans. Yep. Though, as mentioned before, this does make for some rather uncomfortable situations if you compare, if you do any sort of like real world application. Uh, hi, Papyrus. Uh, because, well, when you can instantly tell on site based on someone's appearance if they are a good guy or a bad guy, um, that's a real easy parallel to racism. Yep. Which I, yep, which I know is not Jake's intent, but we're a literary analysis channel. We have to kind of, you know, mention this. And that's also kind of what I was getting at by mentioning that his idea is one that is very privileged and simplistic. The idea that you can tell who's good and who's bad on a glance is one that is really only workable in an extremely privileged position. I'm trying to come up with... You know where I'm going with this. In the real world, the evil doesn't always wear neat uniforms that make them identifiable. Right, yeah, yeah precisely. And... But like, as mentioned, we're looking at fairy tale bedtime story things, and if you are five and wanting to go to sleep, you just want to read, just have your dad read you a nice story while you drift off. It's fine. But we're a little digging into it deeper because that's kind of our thing. But... Yeah. It also so, it also sets that idea as a precedent in the mind of young children. True. But yeah. The tone in which all these characters are introduced does not really, you know, allow for any nuance. Most of the mice are just, you know, normal everyday people going about their day, la 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 la, cook some food. The rats, the stoats, the other vermin are always introduced in villainous terms, lurking around, and yeah, it's there's no mistaking it. If you are meant to be a good guy, you are meant to be a good guy. If you are meant to be a bad guy, you are basically the type who will actually throw the baby in the blender. Bad guy. There's not a whole lot of subtlety going on. Yeah, um, this does kind of lead to just characterization almost seems to go by species more than by individual personality. Like, Clooney the Scourge is not just a rat, but the most villainous rat, but he is still, you know, a rat first and foremost. Um, there's even a little bit of uh, vermin racism within the ranks, where why would he promote a stoat above us other rats? Ra 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 and being willing to backstab each other over that. Um, in Redwall, the mice are very clearly in charge, except for, you know, the old badger who's also there, but she still listens to the abbot, who is a mouse. Like, I actually get several books before they put a non-mouse in charge. But... Yeah, with that in mind, it's really easy to look at Redwall and see a very, very clear cast system. The mice, despite being some of the smallest ones around, are at the top of the totem pole. And...
it feels like this is a a result of Jake's deciding to have the uh, have the mice be the main characters. And since the mice are the main protagonists and the cornerstone of the of the storyline, they are the ones that the plot is told through and are thus put in all the positions of authority. At least on the good guy's side. I'm having trouble putting putting this into words. I do love some of these sprite designs. But yeah, basically the species you are determines pretty much what you're going to do. Um, and how you're going to be received. Like, moles are hard workers and don't generally get anybody's advice on it and they talk funny. Uh, hedgehogs, still hard workers, so on and so forth. Otters, strong hunters. You know, hares are eccentric old soldiers. All of them. I don't think we actually meet any that are non-combatants. And, yeah. But then we do get, actually, a couple examples of wild cards in this in the story. One would be the Sparrows. The Sparrow tribe that has uh, taken up a nest, uh, its nesting position in the Abbey's attic. And the sparrows are the sparrows are they're <laughs> there is really no good way to put this. The sparrows are very similar to a lot of old stereotypes regarding indigenous peoples. Yeah, but in terms of the hero-villains situation, only really three of them matter. Uh, Warbeak, Dunwing, and uh, Bullsparrow. Warbeak is introduced first as an antagonist, uh, shot down when they are trying to shut the weather vane for the store. Um, she does escort Martin to safety, they kind of strike up a friendship. She and her mother protect him from King Bullsparrow. Who, do, who did have the sword and the sword belt, and uh, lost it to Asmodeus. He just wants to, you know, to be in charge. Is literally insane and uh, slings his weight around with the sparrows. And Dunwing just has to learn how to navigate around him. So, while Warbeak and Dunwing are heroic, or at least you know, neutral to heroic, friendly to the hero, if only because he saved Warbeak's life or brought her back, he didn't really do much saving. Uh, they help him escape when War when the King Bullsparrow Bull takes him prisoner. Bullsparrow 
Stefan basically returns early in the middle of the escape attempt and immediately attempts to kill Matthias for stealing the sword belt. Which, to be fair, he was stealing the sword belt. Yep. Like, yes, the Sparrow stole it first, but... You know, this is kind of a never-ending thing. Oh, poor Pyrus. So silly. So, Warbeak is actually an interesting situation. She is injured in the process of a skirmish between the, uh... Between the Sparrows and the, uh, Redwall citizens. process of being captive, they basically put a collar and leash on her. Oh, stupid ball. Okay, I got money. Yay! Uh, in response to this, she's basically crippled. She's unable to fly. They tie a brick to the leash so that she can't fly away, even after she recovers. And Matthias ends up hauling the brick around so that he can keep uh, Warbeak at hand. Regarding this is that Matthias, uh, well, good news in quotes. <laughs> uh, Matthias kind of gets a taste of his own mess medicine after he is captured by the sparrows. They take the leash and collar off of Warbeak and they put it on Matthias. And Matthias, at least, has the sense to respond to this with. Oh, this is terrible. I don't like being bound and humiliated like this. I will never do something like this to another creature again. Which is a learning moment. Which, you can respect that. But it is... That is a dog. Oh, the puppy wanted to pet you.
This is such a silly dog. Yes. He's so happy. I like how you have like six options to pet. I'm curious why the weapon is a spear when the dog has a sword. Uh, make sure you get the point. But yeah, so the morality seems a little bit off because, as mentioned, at times it seems to verge on. Whatever is right is whatever the protagonists say is right. And because the uh, the Red Wallers are always the good guys, nothing they do will be seen as bad in the eyes of the story. Like, Matthias, as we said, dangles Warbeak over the edge and threatens to drop her until she behaves. If a villain had done that to the heroes, the narrative would absolutely blast them for it, but... Yeah, the only comment that Matthias gets is when they give him a collar upstairs. And that doesn't last that long, but I don't know if Matthias actually learned anything. I mean, he, he says he does, but... Yeah, I was about to say, he, he it does say, and he does say in his own thoughts that he does at least learn finding somebody like that is not cool, and he really shouldn't do it. And he gets it. Like I said, he gets a taste of his own meth medicine. <laughs> and, uh... Oh, I need to go down. And learns that, no, that's not very fun at all. Maybe you shouldn't treat people like that. And maybe you should see the sparrows as people. Which they do. I believe it's mentioned at the end of the book that they basically renew an alliance when Warbeak takes over and their sane leadership. But I also don't recall if um, any other sparrows show up in later books. I know some birds do, but... Speaking of, the other wild cards would be, um, is it Captain Snow? The Owl? Ah, uh, yes, and, Captain uh, Snow. And Squire Julian Gingivere. Though Captain Snow errs on the side of villain to threat, considering he's mostly known for I'm here to eat you. And half the challenge is Matthias getting to speak with him without getting eaten. On the other hand, Squire Julian is just a vegetarian Pris who doesn't want to be bothered. So, he's there, he just does his own thing. Even though, as a cat, he probably could easily solve most of the problem himself, but, you know, he doesn't want to. Not his fight. Dogs. Anyway, I think there's not really too much more of this to add. Yeah, not really. Just needed to be talked about because the black and white morality is very, very central to Red Wall and puppies. We will continue next time. See y'all then.